Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Gibbs. I hope you can hear me. Welcome. And uh, if you can let me know if you're there by putting your name in the in the chat window, or at least your username, or at least just say I'm here. Hi everyone, this is Michael Gibson. Welcome. Is anyone here? If you guys could just let me know in the chat box. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Gibbs. I hope you can hear me. Welcome. And uh, if you can let me know if you're there. Hi, Natalia. Welcome. Natalia, what we do on these morning and hi, Wind Howlers. Welcome. Good morning. How are you both? Always happy to have you here, just to let you guys know, there's approximately a 30 second delay between the time I say something and the time you guys hear it, and the time you guys type something and the time I respond. So if there's a delay of any kind, uh, please understand that's the reason. Derek, welcome, good morning, it's good to see you here today. I see there's some more folks that, folks that looks like they're waiting and that's great. Um, do any of you have any questions regarding your cloud computing career? what to study, what to learn, uh, a goal of a certain kind of career and you're looking for guidance on how to get there, just let me know and I'll do anything I can to assist you. While we do that, I'll let everyone know that this morning um, we released a video. I'll drop a link to the video, today's video from this morning. And it's some common mistakes that people actually make when they're interviewing for cloud architect or solution architect positions. And I've seen it a lot. And the reality is, is I hate to see these mistakes because they can literally stop an interview in its tracks. So like anything, I try to make some videos to try and make life a little easier for others. So others don't have to make the same mistakes and they can get to their careers faster. So let me drop a link to that um, because I think that would be helpful to everyone. And that's why we created this video today. Do any of you have any kind of career questions this morning? Or anything for which you would like help or guidance? I'm here to help in any way you guys desire. So if you guys have a question, please let me know. Um, that's why I do these live streams to try and help out. Are you all looking for positions or you're working your current positions? Hi, Anwar. Welcome, good morning. So, Anwar, welcome for joining. i um, thrilled to have you all here. Um, I do these sessions every Wednesday because I know people have a lot of cloud architect or solution architect or cloud computing career questions. And my whole point is to keep people from just going down the path, for example, where they say, what certification should I take? And a thousand people respond. and and, uh, and and so I want to really make sure we can guide people. So Anwar, you're a fresher from India. Great. Um, how can I help you, Anwar? Do you have a goal of a kind, or are you just Stanley? Good morning. Welcome, uh, Alexandra. Okay. So you're the first question. Um, as soon as I see your question, great. And then after that, if Anwar has a question, I'd love to respond to it. And then Stanley, good morning. When Howard, you recently joined as a smooth solution architect and a small scale provider. Wonderful. Congratulations. Part of the job you have to prepare a bill of materials comparing equivalent AWS or GCP deals you get from client up. It sounds very common. You want to know, you wanted to know, is this something you can expect in other companies? 
Typically speaking, as a, as a cloud architect, you will be the designer of the system. I mean, not a configure, the designer. So you're going to join, uh, you're going to meet up with the customer, you're going to ask a lot of questions, business, legal, technical, their end state, their future goals. Then after that, you're going to come back and design it. And then uh, creating a bill of materials or, or the list of the services you're going to use, extremely common. Now, typically speaking, the more senior you are as a cloud architect or a solutions architect or an enterprise architect, the more you're going to be speaking conceptually and the more your team of more junior people is going to create that bill of materials for you. But as a cloud architect or a solution architect, creating the architecture, meaning asking the client, you know, what systems do you have? What are your business goals? What are your, what are your, what are your legal regulatory requirements? What do your current systems look like? What's your desired future challenges? What are your competitors doing? From that, we typically design an architecture. From that, that's when we say, okay, if we need object storage, if we're on AWS, we're going to pick S3. If we need block storage on AWS, we'll pick EBS. If we need a network load balancer. What are my options on AWS? It's going to be an elastic load balancer, for example. So architecturally speaking, we're going to pick the services, and they're not going to have a name. And then after that, we're going to determine the bill of materials or the list of services for the provider. So that's exactly what you would be doing as a cloud architect. Um, those kind of things, not using the management console, not using the CLI. So yes, wind handlers, that's pretty common stuff. Hope I answered your question there, wind handlers. Actually, to uh, put it uh, into context, I'll read off the list for you because I think it's a good list for everybody to know. But uh, during Gartner, who basically evaluates technology people, um, what they had done is they actually started asking chief information officers all over the world, what do you desire to have in a cloud architect? And the reason they did this, um, and I'll, I'll just read it to you for them, is, is what happened is there were all these silly job descriptions that were totally ir irrelevant and unrelated to cloud architectures. So Gartner, who, uh, when this is published in CIO Magazine, and I'll leave you guys the link to it, because it's always good to know the source of information, and and what did they say they wanted a cloud architect? They wanted someone that could lead the cultural change for cloud adoption, develop and coordinate a cloud architecture, develop a cloud strategy, find talent with necessary skills, assess application software and hardware, creating a cloud broker team, establishing best practices for cloud across the company, selecting pro cloud providers, overseeing governance, working with the IT security people to make sure that the systems are secure, managing budgets and operating and estimating cost and operating on scale. So uh, that's exactly what cloud architects do. Um, it's the design and the billing and the cost. So there you go. Um, but that's why it's different than a cloud engineer who's going to be building these things. So Alexandra, you're next. You recently completed the social solution architect, and you've, uh, but you don't feel like you actually know anything in an applicable way. Well, Alexandra, I will give you the honest answer. I've interviewed a thousand AWS certified solution architect associate and professionals, and unless they had a network background or a data center background, I have yet to see a single one that actually knew anything in an appreciable way. The cloud is a virtualized network and a virtualized data center, Alexandra. With regards to that, what do I mean? If you don't understand the network, how it works, why all of it gets used, routing, IP addressing, and then you don't understand the data center and you know what goes into these servers and how they're architected and how they're designed and server virtualization like with type one hypervisors like VMware ASXi or KVM, container management, firewalls, routers, switches, real load balancers, not the not the logical kind. It's very hard to understand that and move that. I will tell you how I train architects, and you know you can do it with us or you can follow my. Uh, you can follow our syllabus and do them on your own, and I'll definitely give you the answer to that on how we do it. It is really necessary to be an architect to first understand the architect position. <clears throat> what is the architect position? It is a cross between a business executive and it's a cross between an engineer. It's a cross because you're going to have to know how to do the following. You're going to have to know how to meet with a client and literally ask the right questions. And we have about a hundred questions that we typically ask our clients to get a feel for things. And after you meet the clients and you ask these questions, then you're going to do evaluation of the current systems. And after you, you, uh, you do learn the network in the data center, 
then you can basically be in a position. So what we do with our programs is, is, is we do as follows. And you can, I'll, I'll, I'm going to list all the syllabus. You can either train with us, and we know we can get you to your destination fast, or you can try and do this on your own, but at least you'll be, you won't be blind and you'll know you'll have a map. So we take two days a week with our clients, actually three these days, and we do live architecture training, in which case we present a challenging situation to them and they design an architecture. Because certification doesn't teach architecture at all, not even zero, the Certified Solution Architect Associate, I would say, is 3% of what's necessary to work as a functional cloud architect. So we do two, two live architecture sessions per week. In addition to the architecture sections per week, we have to teach the cloud, which is what is the network and what is the data center. And if we don't teach that, it's impossible to make a cloud architect. Then what we do with our students is as follows. After we've taught them everything that makes the cloud and we do architectural designs together twice per week for a total of six hours per week of live training, we have our students do some training during the week. And the training our students do during the week is as follows. On the tech side, we do the following. We have our students build every piece of technology that makes the cloud possible. We have our server, our students set up server virtualization. You could do this on your own if you have a server. Um, you're going to need a 16 core server with 120 gigs of RAM, but you could do this on your own. Set up server virtualization, build containers, build firewalls, build uh, VPN devices, set up a Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack, set up MySQL for Active Directory, and then when you're done that, now that you know the things that make the cloud possible, then you got to go build the cloud. See, our students build their own cloud, so they effectively build their own AWS or GCP environment directly on our servers from scratch, because after you build a cloud, then you know. So that's what we do with our students there, Alexandra, and then we give them architectural case studies, the kind of case studies that only people with five and ten years of experience would do. Now we marry that up, um, with the following, soft skills, emotional intelligence, presentation skills training, executive presence training. It is not possible to become an architect without those skills. Not possible because the amount of information you need to elicit. So whether you train with us or train on your own, you've got to find some type of a thing. Daniel Goldman runs great emotional intelligence classes. They're several thousand dollars, but they're very good. Um, I can say Jerry Weissman, and this, as well as Speakeasy, also produce good speaking courses. They're a few thousand dollars, but they are very good. We use their methodologies because I've been trained with them. We also use methodologies from an MBA program, as well as about 50 other leadership programs, as well as some we develop ourselves. But you've got to focus on those. Train with us. Train with others. Make sure you focus on both the technical piece, but as a designer, as an architect, it must be how everything works. So it's not like you're... Uh, it's not like you're, you're going to focus on configuring things in the management console, Alexandra. It's 100% of how it works and how to design them. So what I did is, I, if you desire to work with us, we'd love to work with you. But, and if not, if you want to go figure out how to do these on your own, you can at least look at our complete and total syllabus, which is there. And if you want to ask us questions about our program, you can call our office, too. It used to be my phone number, and now it's the office number, because, but that's neither here nor there. But you can call our office, and you can uh, ask questions, and someone from our office will help you if you're curious. So, Alexandra, I hope I answered your question. Don't feel strange for being confused with just a certified solution architect associate. Even if you had all 12 certifications, that still realistically wouldn't be teaching you architecture, because certifications don't teach architecture. Certifications teach the name of the service and how to configure them, which is the goal. They, certifications are are required because they help you get an interview, but certifications will not get will not have the content or the knowledge to get you hired. So the next question I see here is is Natalia Mendez, Natalia Mendez, you're in the process of making a switch from T-Mobile sales, that's a good place to start actually, to Cloud Architect. The roadmap should be AWS or Oracle or the Cisco. Natalia Mendez, did you, do you have any tech background at all or just sales, which is by the way a great background um, from T-Mobile, could you, could you uh, let me know there? And then, Maddie, we, I can definitely tell you the formula for being a cloud security architect afterwards. So, 
So Natalia, I don't know all of your situation, so without knowing all your situation, the only guidance I can give you is generic. <clears throat> if you have no tech background whatsoever, but you have been selling phones, the good news is you've been selling phones. Selling phones is actually a lot more like architecture than you would think, because when you're selling phones, the client's going to come in, you're going to ask the client some questions, they're going to tell you what they're looking for, what their goals are, and you're going to try and map them with a good, a good plan, meaning service plan, as well as a phone which is going to meet, meet their goals or needs. So, when you meet with a client as an architect, you're going to meet with them. You're going to ask their business, legal, and technical challenges. And then you're going to try and find a service or solution and design an architecture that's going to meet those needs. So, to tell you, the sales is actually a really good background. I prefer sales to the help desk background, actually, because, you know, it's closer in line to the work of an architect because an architect is much closer to a business person than they are to the engineering side. So sales is a good background. I will tell you this, that it is not just certifications. Certifications are 10%. The rest of it is 90%. Um, as a rule, I have a program and I basically take AWS certified people and then get them hired. In fact, I've been taking a lot of the people from these six and nine months cloud computing programs and then teaching the skills necessary to be hired. And so look at it this way. Now, when it comes to certifications, they don't mean a lot like they used to. The reason they don't mean a lot is there are so many courses out there that can literally make you pass these things completely perfectly and still know nothing. Because of that, you know, uh, because of all the exam dumps and what I call the Udemy courses, and literally you take these courses, they're exceptionally good at helping you pass the exam. But in the end, when you interview the people, they don't have any concept, literally zero concept of architecture. So because of that, you're really in a position when you apply for things to really have to show your stuff and really have to show them how, the, how great you really are. And that's going to come from the following. It's going to come from depth of knowledge. So that means that you're going to need the following. You're going to need to know the network and the data center in depth. You're going to have to know that. There's just no way around it. You're also going to have to know how to present to the CEO versus the CTO versus the CFO versus the COO versus the VP of IT versus the director of IT versus the hiring manager versus the engineers. You're going to have to be able to communicate to all of them. You're also going to have to be able to speak a different language to all of them. Oh, and pistol grips, logs, if we didn't, uh, we'll go back and answer it in a second. So you're going to have to be there for all of them. And again, then you're going to have to be able to design these systems. So that means study the network and the data center. My recommendation is outside of this, you've got to get yourself a server, a 16-core server with 128 gigs of RAM minimum. And you've got to learn and practice every data center technology. You can see all these data center technologies that you need to build in Section 10 of my training program. To be fair, my training program costs less than the server um, that it would cost to buy these things, but that's because my business is a cross between a business and a charitable mission. I just like helping people get their first tech jobs. I've been doing it for 20 years, and it's really great when people tell you. So I would say do that. Now, if you're asking me which certification should you get, if you've got a choice between the clouds, you know, you've got AWS, you've got GCP, you've got Azure, you've got Oracle, I would pick one of the ones for which there's a lot of demand. So there's an incredible number of Amazon jobs available, incredible, and Azure. So because of that, they would be where I would get my certifications in the cloud. Now, I would also pick a specialty, for example, like security or infrastructure, and I would also get an industry certification. So a certified solution architect professional is bare minimum on the, on the, on the cloud side. And then I would get an industry one like a CCNA or a CCNP or a CEH or CISSP if you're interested in security. I need to know exactly which career that you desire and then I can guide you on the specifics because you, the certifications, it's not like there's a blanket certification. The certification is basically, let's see the job that you want, let's see your starting point, and then let's use the certifications as a mean to round out your resume in places where you have less experience and make you look better. So. If you, if you tell me exactly the goal you're looking for, Natalia, I can be a little more specific, but I think I gave you some pretty detailed information. So from what I see is we've got pistol grips logs. Then after that, we've got uh, Maddie. 
And then after that, we have AJ, and I promise to take care of all of you. And if I miss any, just let me know. Pistol grips, logs. Pistol grips, vlogs. So when you design an architecture, what you're really designing is the overall end-to-end -end system. So you'll say, okay, well, on the outside I need a firewall. Well, you might say on the outside I'm going to want some DDoS protection, be it like some Cloudflare or like, let's say you're with AWS, it could be Shield. Then you're going to say I need a firewall. We could use WAF, but we need something more, more with more features. So we're going to use uh, like a Palo Alto or a Cisco thing from the uh, from the marketplace. We desire an IDS IPS system. We're going to get that from the marketplace. We're going to protect our subnets with security. With I'm sorry, with network ACLs. We're going to apply security groups to protect our host. On our host, we're going to put anti-malware protection, a second host-based firewall, that kind of thing. That's what the security architect is going to design. Pistol grips logs. They're not going to be designing the, the what what should be on the list, the access list. But they will definitely be designing. Here's where you need these things and where to place them. The engineers will take the specifics based upon the high-level design you give them, and even the low-level design. Hope I answered your question there, Pistol Grips Logs. If you can let me know if you have any further questions before I move to the next person. Okay, wonderful, Natalia. And Pistol Grips Logs, if you let me know. I know there's about a 30 to 45 seconds, so it takes a little bit of time. So, Matty, you'd like to get into a cloud security architect position. Sure. What's your background, Matty, exactly? Okay, Pistol Grips Logs, the fantastic. And, uh, Maddie, if you want to give me some more information about your, sp your specific background, I can definitely give you more, uh, more information. IT infrastructure domain, could you be a little more specific? I.e., did you design routing and switching environments, or were you a router, more of a router configurer, or were you on the Linux side, or are you on the load balancer side? Um, infrastructure could mean a lot of things to a lot of people, Matty. Wonderful pistol grips log. Matty, while we're waiting for you, AJ, you're an SAP basis consultant and seven years experience. The course that, that's, so AJ, I don't exactly know what your goal is. If your goal is to be a cloud architect, then uh, the course that gets people there basically takes people from wherever they are, you know, new, beginner, or experienced in tech, but not a cloud person, and teaches them how to be a cloud architect is, uh, our career development program, AJ. I will tell you that I, I'm excited that I got another email from another one of my students last night saying he took his cloud architect position. So every time I get one of his emails, which is almost every day now, it's pretty exciting to me. Okay, so Matty, you're saying you used to do um, IT infrastructure set up for the application set up Linux mostly. So, okay, so what I'm taking from this, Matty, and if I'm incorrect, yeah, a AJ, so, so AJ, definitely the course that I listed for you is the right way to transition out. And, and that if you've got more questions about other ways to do it on your own, I'm happily to tell you, but that's, that's something I built specifically for these purposes. But if you want to do it on your own, you have more questions, I am more than happy to answer them as well.
Okay, Cheyenne, um, I'm going to get to your question in a minute, and please hold on and wait. That is potentially the most dangerous thing in all of cloud computing, and I want to make sure I guide you there. I just want to make sure I handle the other two questions first. But I'll definitely tell you about DevOps versus solution architecture versus when it makes sense versus when it will kill your career. So hold on for that. So, so, so Maddie, if you used to handle infrastructure setup, but basically your, your, your definition of infrastructure is just setting up the Linux systems for people, then uh, you're going to have to learn all the IT infrastructure as well as and you wanted to do security, correct? Let me just check. I want to be completely certain. So to, to, to get you from where you're at now, Matty, first you're going to have to learn the network. Without the network, nothing works. And not only without the network, does nothing work. Without the network, you are definitely, definitely, definitely um, not going to be in a position to design these types of things. So you have to understand the network. You're going to have to understand server architecture, container architecture. You're going to have to understand how all these things work together and how to design them. So you're going to have to know that. Then you're also going to have to learn vulnerability analysis and security. So, you know, I have a low of, I have, I'd say a third to half of my students I'm working on building them cloud security architect specialties. And with that, we teach security. We teach security principles. We teach network security principles. We also work on the certified solution architect professional because that's your basically your baseline um, intro level certification to be able to do anything for real in the in the cloud, and then we also typically do a CISSP or a CEH. See what we're doing is we're trying to build a portfolio of expertise certifications that really, really, um, really will get you to your goal, and with that we do that. Plus, the way we do it is we give you about. 250 hours of complicated training and it's not that complicated we make it simple but you know we take all of the network we take all of the data center and we get deep into security CISSP level in our training because the cloud has a hack of the day and most of the hacks of the day are actually occurring because people don't understand what they're actually setting up so we focus deeply into security so to really be a cloud security architect you're going to need CEH or CISSP level of security depth of knowledge and you're going to need a certified solution architect professional and the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, the communication skills, the executive presence, all of that, literally all of that is equally critical to the tech piece to be an architect. To be an engineer, it's important to be an architect. It's at least 50%. We had Amazon on our call the other day because they want to hire 12 of our people and they want to hire people each month. And they said the reason they love our program is quite as follows. We focus on the soft skills, emotional intelligence, these types of things. And if anybody's part of our program, they can see what Amazon had to say in section 18 of our course, where the where they, where I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly the video if anybody becomes one of our students and is desiring. It's a high, AWS hiring manager perspective and financial lift and shift. Um, that's realistically when we do that. And they said the reason they like our students is because we teach that. So no matter who you train with, 50% of your time must be soft skills, executive presence, emotional development, uh, executive pr presence, communication, and things like that. So, hope I answered your question there. And then I see there's a couple of questions. So, one from Wynn Howlers and another one from Dr. Vincent Oppong. I'm going to answer both of your questions at the same time. Our program is 16 weeks. It's approximately 250 hours in length. Twice per week we have live video lectures. We do one on a Monday and one on a Friday, which we record in case people cannot be there. On these video lectures, we design architectures or we do a leadership type training. It's really common on these lectures, and I often do a sample of it on a Tuesday, but we get much deeper with our students because of architectures. And I will, students will ask me a question, just like a real architecture world. I will give them the technical technical specs and they will design an architecture together as a team just like they would in real life and we do that twice per week. During the week we have video training. Our video training could be as follows. It's training on the network, it's training on the data center, it's training on the cloud, it trains on every one of those things. We also have our students build every piece of technology that makes the cloud possible and then um, Dr. Vincent Opong, as well as Wynn Howers, we have you build your own cloud, literally your own cloud computing environment, just like AWS. Because after you've built the cloud, look, everything else is silly easy. 
And when you put that on your resume and someone else's lab says, I set up an S3 bucket, which, okay. And you can say, I built the cloud. The hiring manager is going to hire you. Why? Because they know you're capable. What do we hiring managers care about? We look for individuals that are as following. Technically competent, honest and ethical, energetic, enthusiastic. Energizers bring out the best in others. Someone that's willing to go above and beyond. Someone that knows what they know and someone that knows what they don't know. And you know what happens when a hiring manager sees that you've built your own cloud? It shows. And uh, it shows that you know how to do these things. It shows that you're willing to go above and beyond. It shows technical competency, energy, and enthusiasm. And it just works. So there's that. Then we also have the uh, communication skills training, the presentation skills training, the documentation training, because you've got to be able to do that as an architect. And then we've got about 50 hours of AWS specific training inside of this program to make sure that you're good with that as well. But we train on multiple clouds as well. So that's kind of the way we do our program. Uh, I hope I answered your question, Wynn Hallers, as well as, uh, as well as Dr. Vincent Opong. If you've got more questions, I'd love to answer them. So Cheyang, you're planning on writing your Certified Solution Architect Associate in September. And so could you, uh, so could you tell Mr. Ra Rangswam Ragus, I don't want to mess up your name. Thank you so much. Um, so Cheyang, you're planning on writing the Certified Solutions Architect Associate in September. Good. Can you do DevOps after that? What is your goal career? If your goal career, Cheyang, is architecture, please let me know. Then doing a DevOps certification is the worst possible thing you could do. If your goal is to work in DevOps, Cheyang, then I would say it could be a great thing. So I really don't know what your career goal actually is. If your goal is architecture, architecture is the design of systems. When you design systems, you need to know how they work. So basically, as a designer, you need to know the network, the data center, and architectural principles. SysOps is basically maintenance, and DevOps is software automated release cycles. And cloud engineering is build it. So architect design, engineer build, SysOps maintain, DevOps is you know, automating development pro pro profiles. So should you do DevOps? If you want a DevOps career, great. Now I know there's these, these certification providers in Australia and they're what I call career killers. And their goal is to sell certifications. And they will tell you that to become a certified solution architect professional, that what you should do is you should study SysOps and you should study DevOps and you should do all of this. When you do this, there's a real major problem on your cloud architect resume. The problem is as follows. An architect resume looks like an architect. It's got communication skills on there. It's got infrastructure knowledge on there. It's got presentation skills on there. It's got design skills on there. It's got architecture skills. And when you've studied and you put on your resume, SysOps, DevOps, and every other non-architecture career, the hiring manager looks at this and says, who is this guy? I guess I can give this person a jack of all trades position, which pays half, by the way, and you'll work twice as hard. So don't make your resume look like you just threw a bunch of stuff in the air and it just landed anywhere. If you want to be a DevOps person, study DevOps. If you want to do system maintenance, study SysOps. If you want to be an architect, study architecture. So the reason I'm saying this is I know that there's a bunch of people and there, there's three providers in Australia that are trying to teach people to do this path. And I will tell you, I interview their people every single day and I remediate their people every single day. And after a couple months remediating their people, I get them hired all the time. So I don't want any of you to lose money. I don't want any of you to spend nine months studying things that are completely irrelevant to your career. Uh, because, you know, as a cloud architect, the average one earns $600 a day. A good one can easily earn well over 1000 or $1,500 a day. So every day you're not working costs you a minimum of $600 as an architect. Minimum. So if you're studying SysOps and DevOps and all these unrelated careers, it can only hurt you. So I implore you, I want the best for you, and that's why I do as many free services as I can to go do and study and learn exactly what's in your career and not other people's careers. So... So Wynn Hallers, I'll answer your question in a minute. And uh, Natalia, you can attend right now. The next entry date is literally today. And um, we have new students coming in tomorrow for the new, uh, on Friday with the new student orientation. So the people, if they start today, what'll happen, they'll get access to the content immediately. They'll get all the information and they'll get onboarding on Friday. So Natalia, we'd love to work with you. Um, and that's the information. And if you have questions, 
please, please, please feel free to call. And Natalia, that's why I'm doing this. I really want to raise the level of the cloud computing community. I've been an architect for 25 years now, and I practiced medicine first, and I loved it. Like, I loved it. But I just found that I love tech more than anything else in the world, and I just loved it. And I started working in the tech, and, you know, when I was in tech for a little bit, I started mentoring others. And the next thing I realized, two decades later, I'm helping people find their first job. And... You know, my family is basically from a developing nation and we know what it's like to grow up on the poor side. So when you work three jobs to try and survive and all of a sudden you found a, a way to get there and get there easily, I just like sharing the knowledge because it shares the wealth and it brings everybody up. So I love doing it and that's why I created this program. I could charge 10 times more for my program than I do easily and, and sell it all day long. But I do this to basically make it available for people all over the world so they can get jobs and you know, support their families. and. I just love it. Every day one of my students says I got a new job and it excites me. It makes me happy. So that's how I'm spending my retirement. I love it. Um, so when Hallers, in one of your previous sessions, you said that lift and shift is, is the way to go instead of cloud native. Okay, so when Hallers, here's what happened. I am not going to say that lift and shift is right versus cloud native is right. I will tell you that approximately six months ago, there was a social media company inside of AWS, their name was Parler, they were hosted by AWS. And what happened was AWS did not agree with the company's mission. I'm not here to say whether the company's mission is good or bad, I don't care. Um, but what happened is after AWS said we don't agree with the mission, they basically took the customer and they said, you're no longer welcome on our cloud. And what happened when they did that is they kicked them off the cloud and the company went out of business. Now, a lot of the CEOs, a lot of them like me, and a lot of people like me, remember a long time ago when people bought internet bandwidth from the big internet service providers, and then the big internet service providers said to the small internet service providers, we're no longer selling you bandwidth because now you're our competition. So again, they went bankrupt. So there are a lot of people in the business world right now that are saying, I can't go cloud native. If I stick my whole business in the cloud, and then the cloud provider doesn't like me because of some political reason, we could be bankrupt. So cloud native basically went away because CEOs and executives, here's what we care about, I can tell you right now. If I get hit by a bus, who's going to take care of the students that go cloud architects? Because every one of my students needs to get hired at the end of the program. If I get hit by a bus, who can do it? So I'm always thinking of, of you know, what happens if something happens to me? I'm also thinking about what happens to my tech systems, what happens if something goes wrong? I'm also thinking about my data center. I'm also thinking about how do I keep everything running? And just the threat of being able to be potentially kicked off by a cloud provider was enough to basically take 99% of the CEOs that I've spoken to and they all said, I no longer want cloud native. I can't be in the cloud because what if they kick me out? So organizations are going to lift and shift right now because it's easy and they can go to the cloud and they can get off of the cloud pretty easily. It, the other reason organizations are going lift and shift, and I'm not saying that I believe it's a better architecture, I'm not. They're going lift and shift for the following reasons. If we've all had a cable company or a phone company and we stick our stuff, and they give us a really good rate. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And two years later, our rates go up and it's like, oh my God, we don't want to be here. So when you go cloud native, you need to basically take your applications and refactor all of your applications. And that could cost a million, 10 million, 100 million, even a billion dollars for some of these big organizations. So if you spend a hundred million dollars to refactor your applications to the cloud and then the cloud doesn't work on the cloud, you now have to spend another hundred million dollars to refactor off of the cloud. So don't think for a second that I don't think cloud native is cool. Cloud native is awesome. It's just these are the reasons that we were all going to cloud native and the whole industry kind of said, e -e -e, hit the brakes and said, lift and shift is the way to go because of the parlor decision and a few other reasons. I think the best solutions are going to be a combat of cloud native and lift and shift. And every architectural case study is different. People ask me, how do I evangelize the cloud and tell everybody they need to move to the cloud? I say, why would you do that? You do what's in the best interest of the customer. Sometimes it's all data center and the cloud is wrong. Sometimes it's all cloud. Sometimes it's hybrid cloud and sometimes it's multi-cloud. And as a good cloud architect, your goal is to be the trusted advisor and always do what's in the best interest of your customer. Always deliver excellent results. Always make your customer get far, far for more benefit out of your solution than it costs them to buy the solution. You do that, you are a spectacular cloud architect with an unbelievable, unstoppable career. Always make your customers successful. For me, I live by the same principles. We always make our students successful, or at least we die trying. 
Always make your customers successful as an architect and you will have a career where people will look for you all over the place. Let me see who is the next question. McKenna, how is the future for a developer? I think the future is good for developers, always. Having said that, development is not my favorite place for to advise people to build their careers. Now, I think development is great, but here's the challenge. Almost everyone goes to college, that goes to college and studies computers knows some degree of software programming. Almost no one knows the network and almost no one understands architecture. And almost no one knows security and architecture at the same time. And almost no one knows data science and cloud all at the same time. So, is there great careers for AWS developers, which are basically developers that just work on the cloud? Yes. Is it a field which potentially could be easily replaced or outsourced? The answer is also yes. So that's my kind of perspective. Good career, but I think it's got less stability and it will have more ups and downs in the future than, say, other careers because there's so many people that learn how to code. Regarding McKenna's, asked a question, you lost your job, can you get an AWS certificate? Getting an AWS certificate is easy. Now getting a job is a completely different question. Going from certification McKenna is 10%, maybe upwards of 12% at the Certified Solution Architect Professional level, but that other 88% after you have the Certified Solution Architect Professional, it's your knowledge of the network, the data center, your communication skills, your interview skills, your presentation skills, your depth of knowledge about how everything works because this is position, these are design positions here. It's not understanding what's in the certification, which, hey, this is S3 and here's how you configure an S3 bucket. That's not going to get you hired. Quite frankly, in my videos when I recorded, I used my friend's cute little eight-year-old eight daughter to configure all of my things. And... She clicks a couple buttons and she says, easy too, and she's the cutest thing when she does it with her little blonde pigtails. She is really cute, but nobody's going to pay somebody one hundred fifty to $300,000 a year to do that. Um, you can hire someone. I use an eight-year-old little girl because I think it's cute. I really think it's funny and I think it's great, and that's what I love about the cloud is it's so simple. The design is what's necessary for you to get there. Architect's design, so I hope I answered your question. And if you got, have specific questions, I'm happy to help you there. And, but just understand that the certification itself is not enough unless you've been working in networking for a while or data center technology for a while. I know the networking the data center, in which case you don't need any certifications to get a cloud architect job. I know a lot of them that are distinguished in principal architects at all the big cloud providers, and they all went there like me with strong network and data center backgrounds. That's how we all got into the cloud with, with or without any certifications. It didn't matter because we've been building the cloud. So I will tell you this, the first cloud I ever worked with was actually in 1998, and it was Frame Relay. The second cloud I worked with was ATM, and that was around 2000. After that, I worked with VPLS in around 2002. And then after that, my team had consulted to all the cloud providers in terms of how to build the cloud. So, you know, when you're doing these kind of things, the cloud's easy. But, you know, if you're just reading the book, it's going to be challenging. Um, as it turns out, okay, so... So, and, and actually, to let you guys know, networking is so important. I mean, networking is so critical to cl the cloud that I'm actually going to hold the free five-day AWS networking bootcamp live on YouTube. Here's the link. You can register. We're going to do it on uh, the week of July 13th. It's going to be four days straight. The questions and answers, just like this YouTube live format, and we're going to do it for you guys completely free because it matters so much. So pretty important. I think it's a, it, not, and that, that everybody knows networking. In our program, let's face it, we get into deep, deep, deep networking and we go to a level that's, that's, that's a, you can't even imagine. If you can look at our free YouTube videos, you can just imagine what our paid programs are like. But having said that, you know, it's still important for us to provide quality content to the industry and we're going to release this boot camp for free and live. Please sign up and we'd love to work with you in any capacity our students or otherwise. We just really care about this community. And if people have questions, you know, please feel free to call our office. Now, Melvin Batista, you say cloud architect or sysops, and they are completely opposite careers. What do you like to do, Melvin? Because that's going to be your answer. 
If you like to just sit behind a computer all day long and write programs and scripts and automation and use things like Terraform, that's SysOps. All day long, you're going to be the maintenance man of the technology. If you like to design and get in front of customers and present things, then being a cloud architect is a much better position. Now, I will tell you, you have two to three times the income earning potential as a cloud architect than you ever will with SysOps because it's customer facing. And anytime you get into customer facing roles where you have to present and speak, the skill set becomes very rare. And when I worked at Cisco, when I first got there, I was, I guess it was in 2003, I had a manager and he said, Mike, do you want to know the difference between a $100,000 engineer and a $300,000 engineer? And I said, yes, I do, I do, I need to know how. And he told me it was communication skills, executive presence, presentation skills, empathy, emotional intelligence. So I said, I'm not sure. He said, would you go to training? And I said, yes, yes, yes. He sent me to training and poof, you know, my, uh, my career instantly rose and it was like a rocket ship. So... I've seen it work. I've been using this with my students forever. So figure out which side you want to be on. And Melvin, I'm happy to ask you now. If you want to, if you have any more specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. But uh, you got, but if you're asking me, I don't know what you like. And I want you to love what you do because you're going to be doing it every day. Does anyone have more questions or other questions? Or did I answer your questions there, Melvin? Okay, Melbourne, fantastic. Any other questions for me? Give you guys about one more minute. If there's no more questions, we'll end this. If there's more questions, I am always happy to take as many questions as anyone desires. As long as I have the time. Okay, Melvin, so you said you worked in IT. Um, if you're asking me about Cloud Architect, that's still IT. Or are you referring to you just don't want to be the person that's stuck behind the computer for hours on end while other people are you know, enjoying themselves? Is that what you mean by that, Melvin? Because i got to tell you, I've been an engineer and I've been an architect, and I'd rather be an architect any day of the week. Lifestyle's a lot better, pays a lot better, but more importantly, it's a relaxing, enjoyable job. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the engineering job. They are great jobs, and I had them, and I had fun with them. But I worked for it. As an architecture, it's a little different. Most of the time as an architect, I'd meet with a client, I'd take them to lunch, and go home, I'd write a document, or I'd meet with the client and take them to dinner. Again, it was a lot easier than, than sitting behind the computer all day. Now, I enjoyed building, sitting behind the computer, and I worked with it, but, you know, we all grow into things that we desire in different stages of our lives. We find different things, too, that were more fun, so... It's all about finding what's going to make you happy. You know, Mark Twain said it, and you know, it's so true. He said, if you make your, vaca your vocation, meaning your job, your vacation, you'll never work a day in your life. And let me tell you um, that uh, coaching people, I work a lot, but I don't really work. I love every moment of it because it's exciting to see people get ahead. So that's all I can, all I can say from there. So. Ream Dog, which is better, Solutions Architect Associate or SysOps Associate? Ream Dog, what career would you like? Do you want to do architecture, which is more design? Or do you want to do maintenance on systems? That'll determine which is better. Now, if you're asking me which pays better or which has more career potentials, I can answer that. So if you can just be a little more specific. Melvin, if you like being with people and speaking more with people, I'd brush up those skills. I'd become great at them. I mean, because you have to be great at them, and then I'd focus on architecture and not SysOps, but I also wouldn't study any SysOps as well. Ream Dog and Startup Presentation Skills. Um, there's not there, there's a tool. <laughs> there's no tool. This is a skill you have to train yourself with. You have to learn how to read an audience. 
you have to learn the difference between um, the visual, auditory, and the kinesthetic types. You're going to have to learn how to speak to the functional type versus the intuitive type versus the analytical type, for example. You're going to have to need learn how to read the audience of the body language. You're going to have to look and make eye contact with four quarters of a room, for example. You're going to have to learn how to how to start with the solution and then work your way into the evidence. You're going to have to learn how to tune that message for the executive and the audience. I will tell you this, in my perspective, you know, I, I took about twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars of training just to learn how to present better easily. Plus, you know, I've delivered you know, five to ten thousand presentations. So we do a lot of presentation training. So there's never a tool. Every time you see a tool, realize the tool is like three percent of it and the rest of it is you. The tool is the window dressing, it's not the foundation of the house. So you you've got to learn that. So I hope I answered your question there. And Reem Dog, if you're asking which pays better, sysops or architecture? Architecture is customer facing, sysops is behind the computer. When you get customer facing, you earn so much more. Architects can earn two to three times more easily than sysops people. So I hope I answered your question there. Well, wind howlers, all I can tell you is not only do my students all get hired, well, not all, all of them get hired, but 90% of them get hired. I will also tell you that AWS brings their hiring managers on our calls and talks to our students. In fact, the call that you can play if you were one of our students would actually be in Section 18 of our core AWS hiring manager perspective. Our hiring managers love what we do, and they're very fo focused on our program. We have over 100 recruiters that we work with in our program to try and guide people to positions, although we want others. And they are very interested because if you listen to that course, that, that video from the AWS hiring manager, he said the reason he supports this program is we're not like the rest. He said certification is just not enough. He said, you need the certification, you need the architecture knowledge, and he said you're the only people that teach the communication platforms that are needed to be an architect. So that's why he loves our program. So there's lots of people that are interested in our program, and a lot of our people have been hired already prior to even finishing the program. So let's see, going through these things. Vitality, it's a good question. You got your, so what is K8CKAD? Uh, one of the things that I can definitely um, encourage you all in your architecture careers is how to write more simply and how to write more specifically. Don't use abbreviations. I may know that K8 is generally referring to Kubernetes, um, but by the time you're done with, people are done with certifications and acronyms, it can all mean different thing. There are literally 10 to 20 different tech acronyms for everything. So I don't know what your career is, Vitaly. Um, what career do you desire to be? Do you desire something in architecture? Do you desire something in development? Do you desire something in DevOps? If you tell me your career, then I can tell you um, whether the Kubernetes training like that is appropriate for you. Actually, you pretty much spotted it, Sugar, Sugar and Raj. SysOps is like cloud, cloud admin, cloud maintenance. So read, Reem Dog. Uh, no one. There's really nothing you could ever do with the cloud practitioner. That's why we always advise our students to never take the cloud practitioner exam. Um, the first exam people should potentially do is the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate. The Cloud Practitioner and the Certified Solution Architect Associate are about the same level of difficulty. With the Cloud Practitioner, there's basically less than, a, no, there's basically a 1% or less chance that you can get hired as anything other than a sales rep. So we never, ever, ever want anybody to take the Cloud Practitioner. We start them with the Certified Solution Architect Associate. With the Certified Solution Architect Associate, you've got about a 5% chance of getting a job, which is two and a half times greater than with the Certified Solutions Architect Associate. And we bumped that up to about 12% just by getting the Certified Solution Architect Professional. So instantly, um, the first thing you need to do is get something that matters. And we skip the Club Practitioner. There's no reason for anyone to overtake that. I recommend everyone skip that. If you've already taken the Club Practitioner and passed the exam, next exam should be the Certified Solution Architect Professional. Skip the Associate. Every certification course that you take costs you time. Time equals money. 
If the average cloud architect earns six hundred dollars a day every day, if you if it takes you three months to do an exam, that's thirty six thousand dollars of lost income. Only do exams that matter. So because of that, then uh, I'd say skip the cloud practitioner. But getting cloud certified is a great thing to do. I said, Reem, I said it's the same level of difficulty. Um, the cloud practitioner, they spend a whole lot of time talking about things that are like, honestly, they, they make up all these terms and then they talk about the terms, but there's no point in taking that exam. The level of difficulty is the same for the Certified Solution Architect Associate. Just skip that cloud practitioner and completely avoid the whole thing. Amazon will make any exam challenging. And they're all going to be the same level of difficulty. From the senior ones to the junior ones, it's just the questions they ask are different. So skip the ones that, that really you don't need to take. Okay, so I knew, so the reason, Melvin, I have to be specific is in architecture, you need to be very specific. There's a lot of different Kubernetes certifications. Some are related to application developers, some are not. You got to be the right one. So in general, just because I knew k with Kubernetes, I still wanted more specificity because for example, NFV could be network function virtualization, but it could be a 10 other different things. Never, ever, ever use uh, an abbreviation for those reasons. So, Vitaly, if you're looking for DevOps careers, then a, the, a Kubernetes application developer would be fantastic. That would be very good for you then. Okay, so moves, good question. What I was referring to, and this is really more a career um, session, but you asked the tech question so we can answer it anyway. We have the time. Uh, is what I was referring to is when you have a database, specifically a relational database, the systems get busy. So you can, the you know, first thing you can do is use a bigger computer, compute instance or, or virtual machine. But at some point, you can't scale your virtual machines any bigger. So at that point, what you need to do is the following. Um, you need to add read replicas. By adding read replicas, you take the read load off of the system. And by doing that, you know, the system is you know, more likely to stay up at operational. Remember, these systems basically get killed or died when their CPU is at 100%. Basically, nothing functions at that point. So basically, by adding read replicas, the first thing you can actually do is reduce read load, which basically means the main database only has to do with write load. Then you can introduce caching, which will further reduce load on the read replicas, which will further reduce load on the main database, which will help you scale more. Then you can add a queuing system, and here's where you're going to really improve the health of the system. So if your messages on the way to the database get stuck in a queue, and they can, the queue can be drained when the database has the same performance, the system will scale, the system's CPU isn't going to hit 100% because you can slow down the messages, or at least it'll reduce the likelihood. So that's what we meant was when we were talking about keeping the system, improving the performance by decoupling it. Mooj, great question. You have an interview coming. I have over 10 interview videos that ask questions on my channel of the questions they will ask and the as well as the answers that will get you hired. Let me see if I can find uh, the link on my channel to the question YouTube videos. I have this constantly. Melvin, great. If we can save you three months in your career, I'm so happy you uh, joined this call because it'll, it'll, it'll help you get to your goals faster find on my channel. I think I have a playlist on all the things for your for your uh, for your YouTube videos. Let me get that for you um, because we produce this video to help people with their interviews. So bear with me, preparation and interview training. So I have uh, 17 videos to help you with to help you with your interviews. I'm gonna put pop the link to this playlist here. Rook 07, you notice the CISSP comes to be naturally good, as is more theoretical. Can you focus on that 
And the cloud professional instead of adding the CEH? Yes, totally. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter which one of those two certifications you have. You just need a good industry certification like the CISSP or the CEH, like we say, and an AWS certification. And that'll give you 25% of what you need. There's still the other 75% matters, which is the communication and the development and the site. But that those two combinations give you at least 25 to 30%, which is a lot. Big help. Any other questions? My team has told me that I should put a link to our program, so I'm going to do so, as well as a coupon code. And if anyone's interested in our programs, they can call our office here. Shanesh, um, it's a good question, but I need a little more specifics. You're asking me for a beginner, what kind of security things do people know to be a cloud architect? Um, for example, um, exactly what do you mean by that? While I wait for the answer, Muj, if you go through the titles of those videos, um, most of them are competency-based questions. Do not ignore the non-competency-based questions, Muj. They are more important than the competency-based questions. I am telling you, they are equally important. I will tell you, after 20 years of coaching people, the people that focus only on the tech are the hardest to hire. It is easier for me to get someone with less technical competency a job than the best technology professional in the entire world if their communication skills aren't right. So it matters that much. But the, we do both in those. Melvin, um, here's my experience. Finding someone that's truly capable of, of actually doing the job knocks out 98% of the people that you interview. 98% are gone just due to competency. If you have 10 certifications in 10 different things on 10 different certification providers, every hiring manager will know that you're not competent. Get directed and focused and powerful certifications that matter, Melvin. For example, the Cisco Certified Design Professional and the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, good architecture. Industry deep from Cisco, topical ones from AWS for the cloud. CEH or CISSP plus a Certified Solution Architect Professional, wonderful. If you learn architecture, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me whether you use DynamoDB, whether you use Google Cloud Bigtable or Apache Cassandra. It's an OSQL database and we architects think that way. Knowing that Google calls it a different term, that's it. honestly, it's, it's irrelevant. The way our architects do it, the way we teach our architects as follows, is first you ask the client, just like you do, because it's the real job. Then after the client, you design your systems in a vendor agnostic way, meaning I need a virtual machine with 120 cores and four terabytes around. From there, we just go to a chart. Does it matter if you pick an X1E-32XLG from AWS or a different one on Google Compute Engine? No. Learn the cloud, the rest of it becomes silly easy. That's our recommendation and that's how we train people and that's how we've been successful. And that's what I've done in architecture for over 25 years now. You know, I designed the architecture and then I'd say, oh, Cisco makes a device for this or Juniper makes a device for this. Oh, wow. For this firewall function, I like Fortinet's right now for this one, but that's because it's the, be the best and cheapest for what I need for this particular project. For another project, it's going to be a checkpoint thing. And for another project, it's going to be Palo Alto. So it's all a matter of, you know, designing the right systems for people. And you design the system based upon the customer need, not any specific vendor. So, so notice the CCNA is a great starting point for the network. And so, 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 so a great, great starting point for security. Um, I wouldn't waste my time with anything like that. I would go straight to the CISSP or the CEH. 
Those other starting network certifications are going to take you time, but they're not going to result in anything that can help you get employed. So I would skip all those security pluses and things like that. The only place I've ever seen anybody get a job with that is the U.S. government. So Roku, um, section 18 of our course is where we replay every single one of those calls that we do with our students. We record every last one of them. And that way students can be on the call and watch a replay, or just if they can't make the call, watch the replay. Dream dog. First, we would start with a the cloud in general. By that, learn the network and the data center because if you don't know that, none of it's ever going to make sense. After that, realistically speaking, you've got a couple options. We typically start people off with AWS because they're the largest cloud provider, and because they're the largest cloud provider, we use AWS after we teach people the cloud. Learning the cloud before is kind of like you know. It, and none of it's going to mean anything. You're going to hear the name of services, but, you know, what are they? How do you use them? How do you design them? So, for example, I would say, typically speaking, AWS is your best place to start because it's the majority of it. And then from there, you, you know, you don't need to worry about it. Just master one and then learn others. The next one that I would learn, would, if I was going to learn a second, would be the Google Cloud. Why would I pick the Google Cloud? Because the Google Cloud exams are the closest related architecture exams. Because of that, it's harder to pass these exams than the AWS exams. Because it's harder to pass these than the AWS exams, and because there's less, less Udemy courses available for them, which can make you pass the exam and still know nothing, and there's less exam dumps, meaning ways to cheat on the exam, the exam holds more value, because there's less people that can do it and it's a scarcer resource. So, and uh, realistically, see. Realistically speaking, um, where was I? Where was I actually headed? Um, focus on learning the cloud first, then maybe pick AWS, and then if you're going to learn a second cloud, I would probably pick Google because the salaries are the highest for the people, and the reason the salaries are the highest are due to scarcity. So that would be the approach. Zaki, what a great name! Um, there's no prerequisites for the cloud architect career development. I used to hope that people were AWS certified, and the one I found out after interviewing about a thousand AWS certified people, I had to start them from the beginning anyway, because I had to teach the cloud, and then I had to teach how to design systems. I have no prerequisites for that. I do require attitude, a good attitude, energy, enthusiasm, and motivation. It's a lot of work in the program. Our program is extremely successful, and we're very good at getting people to our goals. But there's a lot of work in the program, and being able to do the work is really important. So that's the thing that matters most to us, is the energy, passion, and enthusiasm to get the job done so we can help you win. Roku 7, the main difference between the associate and professional. Well... Here's what I'll tell you in reality versus ours. In reality, the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate is kind of this intro to like the cloud. And the Certified Solution Architect Professional is a much deeper source of the cloud. If you will go to mine, my AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, I don't run it like anybody else in the world runs their Certified Solution Architect Professional. They all assume you know something. When I do my AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, I assume you don't have any background whatsoever and we have to teach you. So when I start, when I do my Certified Solution Architect Professional, what I actually do is as follows. I start as if it was an AWS, you know, Cloud Practitioner, then Certified Solution Architect prof Associate, then Professional. I go deep, 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 and yes, Vincent, it does apply to the payment plan. So I go deep, deep, I start slow and I work my way up deep, 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 deep. And then I stay deep. So the only difference from my perspective between a certified solution architect professional and a certified solution architect associate is the depth of knowledge and some additional things like RAID and different services that we, you would use. So the certified solution architect professional we use can help you pass the associate or the professional exam because of the way we teach it. We assume that you're starting at a baseline and because we assume that you've been taught basically the following method, how to, the name of the service and how to configure them. But none of that is actually architecture. 
So we basically, we teach it from the beginning. So our, our professional will help you with the associate training program. But we still recommend getting a practice test for these exams because Amazon asks questions in a very weird way. Review and prep. Haman Sharma is their CEO. I think he's a really great guy. I have a lot of faith in him and what they're doing. So review and prep has some pretty good practice exams that we typically recommend. I have no financial gain from review and prep. I just know their CEO and I know, I know some of their executives and I trust them to produce good quality content for their students. So I recommend them. So wind howlers, here's the thing. If you're going to do a lift and shift, the reason I said communication skills are so important is you need to ask the client, what does your environment look like? So if they've got 10,000 servers, you need to know the specs of those servers. You need to understand the utilization of those servers. If their servers are 128 cores with four terabytes of RAM and they're 80% utilized and you go to the cloud, you can't shrink them. You might even need bigger because the overhead of the hypervisors and the and all the other layers in the cloud, which are going to be much slower than the data center. Or if you've got these 128 core servers of 3% utilization, you can shrink them down maybe to four core servers. So you are going to have to determine the specs of every different server absolutely based upon the current system state and what they're working and how you want to migrate them to the cloud. So when howlers, that's what you need to know. As an architect, it's not how to configure things. That's engineering. That is not architecture work. Architecture work requires that depth of knowledge of the servers and the compute and the containers and how they work so you can design them on the cloud to meet or exceed the customer's needs. Yes, that's exactly what you're going to have to do. It's not going to be the management console. It's not going to be the CLI. It's not going to be sysops. It has nothing to do with DevOps. It's all that wind howlers. Now I think you're getting it. And what is the approach? Well, that's architecture training. And in our program, we spend hundreds, we spend hundreds of hours of architecture training. It takes a good 100 hours minimum to learn how to answer that question that you're talking about. Uh, if I could do more here, I would. But what I would say is, you know, if you don't train with us, you've got to read all the VMware documentation. You've got to read all the Kubernetes documentation. You need to read all of Dell's documentation for servers, maybe some IBM documentation for servers. You're going to need to go to F5 for DNS, and you're going to need to go to F5 for load balance. You're going to need to learn all this stuff. That's the job. You have to know everything of how it works to migrate it to the cloud. Nothing to do with the management console, nothing to do with SCLI. And that's why people won't hire you with just certification training because the certification training doesn't teach any of that and that's the job. The certification training teaches junior implementation engineer training. Here's S3, how to configure a bucket. But as an architect, you know, are we going to use block storage or object storage? Why? If we use this type of storage, what's best? How do we optimize the performance of this? None of that is configuring. So, when howlers, I um, hope I answered your, your questions. Roku7, you feel confused on both the associate and professional. Would like to know if there's any method to handle the materials as, as they seem to be understanding sub bits and find some arrows hard. Um, yeah. Um, if you're one of our students, it's all outlined in our program. If you're not one of our students, if you're conf confused on the networking, then uh, if you're confused on the if you're confused on the networking, and you're not one of our students, go to Cisco, read a couple of CCNA and CCMP books, and then you'll be done with that. If you're confused on the on the load balancer piece, go to F5, read their documentation, and be done with it. If you're confused on Kubernetes containers, then you got to read some Kubernetes containers. So Roku 07, you will be confused by just doing certification training. There's no other way around it. To become a Cisco certified um, internet expert, which is my first certi my, one of my main certifications, I had to read 75,000 pages of reading, and that was minimum, just necessarily to be able to pass that exam. 75,000 pages of reading on just the network. I'm not saying that you need that, but to be an architect, you need like the equivalent of about 15 or 20,000 pages of reading. It's not something that you're gonna get in that book. All of my students get that in part of our 250 hours of training. But if you're not with us, and that's okay, make sure you go to the source, Cisco. It's our Active Directory, you got to go to Microsoft. Then, Roku, if you're a student in the program, you know, submit your question on Friday. Ask any questions you have, and we'll answer this. The Friday, the Friday call. Or the Monday call. Or use the Slack channel.
But this, your question is going to be uh, something that needs to be done much more on a deep call on Friday where we can actually ask you questions and you can speak. So let's make sure we address that question for you tomorrow. Reem Dog, I will tell you, if anybody has more than three certs, I won't even consider them as a candidate because I know they're too focused on certification versus capabilities. I also don't care about the amount of experience a client, a customer has. Ever, experience is irrelevant to me. All I care about when I hire, which is most hiring managers care, are are you able to do the job? That's number one. Number two, can I trust you? Do you know what happens with 90% of interviews? Um, somebody bluffs or lies, and because of that, I can't trust them, the interview is over. Then I care about attitude, energy, and enthusiasm. From there, I care about communication skills and passion and emotional intelligence. If you can do the job and you have zero experience, but you've got a background on your resume that's good and you can answer my questions, you're hired. And I've hired lots of people like this and they did well. Number of years experience, nobody cares. Everybody cares about competency. Now, you will see job interviews where basically they have a lot of these things. Experience, experience, experience. That's because they're trying to keep you from applying. What do I mean by this? I've interviewed 5,000 people in my career and I've only been able to hire 10 of them. And only three were great of the, of the 5,000 interviews I've done. It's that hard to find someone good. So when you find someone good, and of the three that I hired, two of them had no background whatsoever and I didn't care because their attitude was so good and they turned out to be the best. It's no big deal. So attitude, energy, enthusiasm, soft skills. When people say, what are the hard skills? I'll tell them the hard skills. But the hard skills without the soft skills, they will never get hired for any architect job. It's that simple. Soft skills for architecture matter at least as much as hard skills. We can't hire someone to go sit and speak to the customer, uh, the CEO of a customer that's giving us $100 million a year business if they can't communicate. Can't do it. Won't hire them. So, and AWS even said it on their call when they came in to speak to our students. That is the most critical part as long as you have the basic knowledge. So what is the basic knowledge and what are the hard skills? I'll tell you guys in a minute. And Zachy, uh, it's a 16 week uh, program. So Reem, I answered your question. What are the hard skills that should be learned before you try to achieve for certification? Networking, critical hard skill. The cloud is nothing more than a virtualized network in a data center. If you don't know networking, you can't work on the cloud. Data center. That means servers, containers, load balancers, DNS, which you know, some would call networking, some wouldn't. It means Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. It means knowledge in NoSQL databases. It means knowledge of firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, and how they work and how to design them. It includes access control lists on routers. It includes routing protocols such as BGP, eBGP, IBGP, and ideally OSPF as well. It involves understanding of layer two things in networking like VLANs and Q, dot one Q tagging and Q and Q tagging. It involves knowledge of Ethernet over MPLS. It involves all of the things that are not covered in certification. Basically, everything that's not in certification. But without those soft, soft skills, it's not possible to be a cloud architect. Cloud engineer, sure, cloud architect, no. If you guys are enjoying some of this conversation, if you don't mind leaving a like along the way and or type Cloud Architect, that way we know you're liking the conversation and because uh, um, we, we track these things and we try to produce things that people ask us for that people like. So we want to make sure we serve you the best we can in both our free and paid offerings. Who has the next question? And if, I know you guys can see that I'm passionate about soft skills training. And here's the reason. It tripled my income when I started focusing on it. And not only did it triple my income, it enabled me to take people with literally no background whatsoever and get them jobs for the last two decades. Why is it so critical? Why is it so much of an important part of my system to, when, when it comes to getting your first tech job to having you know soft skills? And why your soft skills matter more? on your first tech job, then even your technical abilities is as follows. 
it's this. See, when we interview people, we interview um, on the following reasons. We interview to find the person that can do the best job. So here's the thing. 50% of the way we score you on an interview is your soft skills, emotional intelligence, presentation skills. 50% is your tech skills. Let's face it, on your first tech job, I cannot get anybody to 50 out of 50 on technical competency because you don't have enough experience. Can't do it. I can get you to a 35 out of 40 on technical competency, which is amazing. And that, by the way, will outscore 80% of the people. And so I can get you to 35 or 40 out of 50 on technical competency, which is awesome. But I can get, if I can get you to 50 out of 50 on the soft skills, the emotional intelligence presentation skills, you're in there scoring an 85 to a 90 out of 100, which is unheard of. Rarely do you score someone above a 65. So when you don't have experience and you're lacking experience, you got to make the package look so good. If you had two Mercedes that are three years old each and they both have 30,000 miles and one's all scratched up and scuffed up and one's got a mirror finish, who's going to buy it? You're going to buy the one with the mirror finish for the same price. That's why we've got to get you guys polished up. That's why I have such a heavy emphasis on soft skills. Soft skills are the equalizer. The soft skills are the things that can make, make your experience almost feel irrelevant. So if we can prove that you're competent and prove that you're a delight to be around, you'll get hired. And guess what? You'll get paid a lot more. Do the research. Look at emotional intelligence training. Individuals that train and earn on average of about $29,600 more per year that don't. A good interview can add an additional twenty, ten dollars to $50,000 to your salary. Just that can make millions of dollars of difference in your career just for nothing other than learning how to communicate better. So that's why it matters. It increases your chance of getting hired and gets you paid a lot more. Generational entrepreneur. Is it best to, to skip the associate cert and go straight for the professional? Depends on your background. First, first cloud cert I ever did was a professional cert. Why? Because, no, I knew enough about it. But, and in general, if you have enough knowledge of the network, the data center, and the cloud, I'd skip the associate and go straight to the professional. But if you don't, I would do the associate first. And since when you take the associate, they give you a 50% off coupon for the professional, the cost to take it both in terms of exams is the same. Now, the opportunity cost in terms of time is not. It takes less time to start with a certified solution architect professional and just go straight and pass it. And if you can do that, awesome. That's what I did um, on the Google side. But, you know. If you can't, then start with the associate, but just never start with the practitioner. There's no point. Who else has a question? Anyone else have any questions for me? Any further questions for me? Okay, well, see if there's any more. If there's more questions, I can stay for upwards of 30 minutes more. If not, um, no worries. I'm going to try and do another one next Wednesday. I'll try really hard to make sure that I'm as available as I can for the Cloud Architect community. While you guys are waiting for questions, if you like, if you're enjoying the session, if you can just type Cloud Architect in the window and or leave a like, at least we know that you're, everybody's happy. We want to make sure everybody's happy. Hi, Ali. It's so nice that you're here and we're always happy to share. If you've not been to one of our two webinars, hi Mark. This is Mike uh, Zaki is uh, on the on the call as well. He's actually asking questions. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike. Um, so Mark. Um, I appreciate about the guide, what you're saying on the videos, the hiring process. I think a great resume is important. Um, and resume training is a critical part of our program. 
all the students we work with, we spend a tremendous amount of time guiding them on what their resume should be. I will tell you that I've created a video on what needs to be on your resume. There are resume services and, the, and some of them are very good. I will tell you my experience with resume services and cloud computing is they almost never know exactly what needs to be on your resume because they're very good at making resumes, but if they don't actually understand the cloud architect role, they're not in a position to guide you and they can end up making it a lot worse. I've been working with a lot of people that have gone to resume people and after they've gone to resume people, I then have to fix the resume with them because the resume people are good at resumes, really good, but they don't necessarily understand the architecture role. And the architecture role is so challenging to understand if you're not from it, um, that um, most cases these resume services are not able to help you. I actually made a, a video on how to do this. Um, let me let me go find my video and I'll, and I'll listen to you. We spent a lot of time with our students on how to do it, um, but uh, and that's part of our training program. But here's a video that we put together to try and show you how to tune your resume. Again, it's like nothing that uh, compared to what we do in our students, but at least it's something that's free that you can actually look about. <clears throat> and I think it'll give you much more guidance than what you'd find with the resume service for a cloud architecture role. Read Doug, which sectors are growing fastest? I think, you know, architecture is the fastest because everything's going to the cloud. I think cloud security is probably the best place to be because uh, when you get to the cloud, um, when you get to the cloud, uh, you know, it's less secure. So inherently, plus, you know, very few people actually understand the cloud and there's attacks on the cloud every single day. Most of the attacks are due to misconfigured S3 buckets because people don't know what it is they're actually designing and they're just typing in commands. Having said all that, cloud security is good. I will tell you that I believe cloud data science is massive for the future and we'll be releasing a program with that. There's two data scientists in our organization and I see that as come something that's coming very soon and very important. I also think the infrastructure piece is there. These cloud things are being developed and as they're getting developed, a lot of it's coming out as infrastructure as code. By, and if you don't know the network, none of the things is ever gonna come out right. So I'd say the networking side is good. I'd say anything that you do in the cloud, as long as you're highly specialized is good. The only place that I don't see a tremendous amount of future is in the software development side. <clears throat> DevOps maybe, but not software development. I don't like to study careers or where there's a lot of people that know it. I like to be in a career where there's very few because that way there's more demand, which means you know easier jobs, higher salaries, and much more career potential. Thank you, Vincent. And Mark, I, I pasted the video um, for you already. I just know there's a delay going back and forth. Anyone have any more questions? We look forward to working with you, uh, Dr. Vincent Opong. I think uh, you'll have a wonderful time and we look forward to working with you and speaking to you um, as soon as possible. I'd like to call tomorrow, or Friday, but uh, thrilled to work with you. Anyone have any more questions? Yep. While we wait for more questions to come in, my team has suggested that I put a link to our program along with the coupon code, along with uh, the phone number for our office in case people have any questions. Okay, who else has a question? Any last questions? If not, I'll be around tomorrow, next week. I also want to invite you guys. Okay. Generational entrepreneur. How long do I recommend practicing whiteboarding? 
Well, as an architect, that's, that's, that's an everyday part of the job, um, is design. Our students do it three times a week with me, um, two times per week on the paid program, and then I do like a junior one on Tuesdays. It's not, the one I do on Tuesdays isn't enough to be hired, but it's enough for you to learn architecture, at least get some concepts. Um, so, the one, our, so we do it with our students effectively. They have the opportunity to do it three times a week with me and my supervision, and we assume they're doing it on their own a couple days a week as well. Do we provide exams? We provide training, not practice exams, Reem Dog. Practice exams are cheap and they're, they're abundant out there. Our goal is to get people hired. I could get people hired with zero certifications and certification is the least important part of it for me. My goal is giving people the skills. Getting a practice exam and passing any of these certifications with our training is literally nothing because we make sure you have such a good understanding of how these things work. You could literally get a practice exam and pass in a couple days. That's not a concern. The real concern is making sure that you can actually do the job and pass the interview and when that's what we do. And uh, when you know that the exams are simple, look, let's be fair. My background with, here's how I passed an exam. And I want you to understand what it is to know the cloud. I bought on a Friday, I had scheduled, a, I just wanted to test, you know, our knowledge, our training. So I had scheduled a Google professional cloud architect exam on a Monday. I had not read any of the names of their services other than just doing basic architecture work. Well, I should say more than basic architecture work. I've done a lot of architecture work, but I always just go to a cheat sheet and pick the name of the service on a cloud when I design something, because here's what I know, how to design it. And for me, it's almost irrelevant which service you pick from the cloud provider. That's silly easy. But anyway, I had, I had the Cybux book for the professional cloud architect uh, delivered to my house for the Google one, because that's not one we're teaching. I read it on a Saturday and Sunday, took the exam on a Monday, and finished the exam in about 45 minutes because it was so easy and obviously passed it. Passing these exams is nothing when you know what you're doing. Passing these exams is a challenge when you don't know what you're doing. So we focus on teaching you what it is you're doing, how it works, and getting you used to it so you can be a great cloud architect. And the certification piece which we provide is basically nothing for you. So I hope I answered your question, Ring Dog. We use review and prep uh, for practice exams, and they're very cheap. Who else has a question? We do on, well, wonderful, Dr. Vincent. We will make sure we give you lots of background on networking in the cloud. And I think uh, very soon um, you'll be surprised by how much you know about the cloud. For, for anybody that's interested, on every Tuesday we have a free architecture webinar. And I think everyone will love that. And uh, here's that information now. I had mentioned that we're doing a free AWS networking program, which uh, I'll have my students watch because it'll be extra networking. There's much different networking on our course, but you know, the more training you get and diff the, the better. So we're going to do this free AWS networking bootcamp that's going on. I invited you all to our free architecture webinar as well as our free bootcamp. I will tell you this. Um, we've got a lot of networking coming out and a whole lot of it. And uh, networking is so essential for the cloud. I will also say that we released a basic intro to networking um, video very recently. I'll give you guys the link to that. We This week, we are going to be releasing a BGP video that's going to be in, I'm going to call it an intro to BGP. Um, and, and, and Reem, that'll be, uh, the, that, that message on Tuesday will be at 9 a.m. Eastern, which is 2 p.m. GMT. So that'll help you understand that. Let me show you the networking one that we sent out the other day because we have a BGP one coming out this week, which is going to be a precursor to the next one, which we're going to do next week. And then we're going to get you guys, we're going to introduce a lot of networking to the cloud computing community because lots of people struggle there. Again, it's not going to be what our internal training is, but we do the best we can to help the community for free. Here's one we released on networking a few days ago, and we've got a lot more networking training coming. So who else has questions?
Bem... Any other questions? It looks like uh, it's, if there's no more, I will uh, end the call. And if you guys have any more questions, you know, you can reach out to some of us in any of our other webinars. And from there on in, we will all be there for you. So what we'll do is um, I'm going to list one more time um, the link to our program, the coupon, and then our office number. And then if there's no more questions, we will see you all at another webinar another time. Thank you all. It was one. Thank you all. It was wonderful spending the morning with you. I will uh, try to have another one next week. I invited you all to how to get the how to get your first web job webinar tomorrow. I think you're going to have a wonderful time there. I've invited you all to our completely free architecture boot camp. Um, we've listed our training as well as our phone number as well as our email address if you've got any questions. And at this point, I want to thank you all for spending the time with me this morning. I hope I was able to provide great value to you. I hope I was able to give you some guidance on your career. And we do these free sessions as often as we can because we love the cloud architect community. So anything we can do to help out is just super important to us. So thank you so much. If you found this webinar helpful, please feel free to share it with others. If you've liked it, please like it. It helps our rankings um, and metrics. So we really appreciate that if you do like it. And again, thank you so much. And it's been a wonderful time to speak with you all as both. This morning we released a video and I really recommend everybody see it. The video is based, I'm gonna copy the link to this video on solution architect interview mistakes. Ones that we've seen cost people jobs so many times. So we want everybody to get hired and have a great life. So we made a video on this. So please enjoy. Thank you so much. And I will see you on another webinar very soon.